What would you do if you needed an entirely new engine, but didn't have the budget to design one from scratch? In 1961, in Detroit, Pontiac came up with an answer that stunned the entire industry. They cut a legendary V8 engine in half and installed it in a family car. Not a race car, not a concept, but a mass-produced compact model called the Pontiac Tempest. A small car that could carry six full-size adults, featured an enormous trunk and was connected by a drive shaft as slender as a piece of rope curved and spinning continuously beneath the floor. Today, we're going to dissect the most eccentric marvel in General Motors history to see why it possessed engineering solutions that even modern supercars still approach with caution. When the Pontiac Tempest was introduced, no one expected that. On paper, it would be classified as a compact car. But in reality, it was a vehicle built with full-size thinking, simply compressed into a more compact body. In terms of design, the Tempest made no attempt to hide its Pontiac roots. The front end clearly echoed the split grille, DNA inherited directly from the legendary wide track philosophy of the late 1950s. Despite sharing many body components with its GM siblings, such as Buick, an Oldsmobile, from door frames and glass to the roof. The Tempest still retained a distinct identity. Its body lines were crisp, its proportions well balanced. Neither overly rounded like European cars, nor crude like many American sedans of the same era. It occupied a very strange middle ground, familiar yet different. The automotive press of the time praised the Tempest as one of the most attractive compact cars on the American market in the early 1960s. Buyers were drawn to its mature appearance. Nothing that felt cheap, nothing that suggested a purely economy-focused car. The Tempest was not a compact in the bare-bones, cost-cutting sense of the Falcon or the Beetle. Pontiac positioned it as a senior compact, smaller than a full-size sedan, but larger, more powerful, and more ambitious than ordinary compacts. Compared to the Chevrolet Corvair, GM's controversial in-house rival, the Tempest was slightly larger and followed a completely different philosophy. The Corvair took the European route, a rear-mounted, air-cooled, flat-six engine. Weight bias to the rear, sharp handling, but also full of risk if the driver lacked experience. Pontiac, however, did not believe in placing the engine at the rear for an American family car. They kept the engine up front, where traditional buyers felt secure. But instead of mounting the transmission directly behind the engine, like every other American sedan, Pontiac engineers did something unprecedented. They pushed the entire transmission and differential to the rear axle, creating a complete rear transaxle system. The two ends, the front-mounted engine and the rear-mounted transmission, were connected by a curved drive shaft, something Pontiac called the rope drive. Not a rigid shaft, not the familiar pair of universal joints, but a long, slender torsion shaft spinning at high speed. The idea sounded fragile, even dangerous, but in theory, it allowed vibration to be absorbed, reduced floor height, and improved weight distribution. It was this layout that turned the Tempest into an American car with a very un-American mindset. The front engine preserved familiarity, while the rear-mounted transmission delivered nearly 50-50 weight distribution, something that, at the time, was seen only on European sports cars or race cars. On paper, the Pontiac Tempest was significantly smaller than a full-size Pontiac like the Pontiac Catalina. The Tempest measured just 189.3 inches in overall length, while the Catalina stretched out to 210 inches. Width was also noticeably reduced. 72.2 inches 
versus 79 inches. The wheelbase was shorter as well, 112 inches instead of 119 inches. These numbers earn the Tempest the compact label, even though in reality, it never felt cramped. The secret lay in how Pontiac organized the interior space. Thanks to the rear transaxle layout, the transmission no longer occupied the center of the car. The transmission tunnel, normally a defining barrier in American sedan interiors, was reduced to the point of nearly disappearing. The floor was flatter, more continuous, and that's why three adults could still sit comfortably across the front bench, something almost unthinkable for a compact car. Front legroom in the Tempest measured 44.1 inches, just 1.2 inches less than the Catalina. Rear seat legroom still came in at 37.8 inches, an extremely generous figure for a car more than 20 inches shorter. The Tempest didn't just carry six people, it carried them properly in true Pontiac fashion. And then there was the trunk, where every comparison became absurd. With a capacity of 27.5 cubic feet, the Tempest trunk surpassed even many modern mid-size sedans. For perspective, today's family cars, like the Camry or Malibu, hover around just 15 to 16 cubic feet. The Tempest could swallow the luggage for an entire American family vacation without folding seats or making compromises. Even more remarkable was the engine itself. While most manufacturers would have developed an all-new four-cylinder engine for a compact car, Pontiac looked at its existing parts bin and made a decision so bold it bordered on unbelievable, cutting a V8 in half. The standard engine, called the Trophy 4, displaced 195 cubic inches, hardly small by any standard. In reality, it was literally half of the legendary 389 cubic inch V8, retaining the same bore and stroke, pistons, connecting rods, and even the overall design philosophy. Pontiac used only the right cylinder bank, deliberately leaving the left side empty to house the starter and generator. This was not a crude shortcut, but a calculated decision aimed at optimizing the production line. And just as intended, the Trophy 4 was assembled on the same production line as the 389 V8, allowing Pontiac to significantly reduce development costs. From an accounting standpoint, it was a brilliant move. But mechanical reality doesn't exist only on paper. A four-cylinder engine displacing nearly 3.2 liters without balance shafts and carrying the inherent character of half a V8 delivered an experience that even American buyers of the time found difficult to get used to. At low RPM, the Trophy 4 vibrated heavily, transmitting its pulses directly into the chassis. The sound was raw, harsh, distinctly industrial. It wasn't smooth like an inline six, nor refined like a V8. It felt like an industrial power unit adapted for street use. Pontiac understood this and accepted it anyway. In return, the Trophy 4 delivered strong, low-end torque, well-suited for a family car, and came at a much lower production cost than developing a completely new engine. Output ranged from 110 horsepower in base form to 155 horsepower in the highest configuration, an extremely rare version accounting for less than 2% of total production. Durability, however, was a different story. The timing chain was prone to rapid stretch and could easily jump teeth if not properly maintained, becoming the Trophy 4's most notorious weakness. Many Tempests later earned a reputation for being difficult, not because the idea was flawed, but because owners were unaccustomed to caring for such an unconventional powertrain. And then came the drivetrain, 
where Pontiac truly threw the entire American mechanical rulebook out the window. At the center of this design was something the company gave a very evocative name, the rope drive shaft. In essence, the rope drive was not a conventional drive shaft at all. It was a steel torsion bar, long, slender, and intentionally installed with a curve. Its diameter alone was enough to make American mechanics of the era uneasy. Just 0.65 inches on automatic cars and about 0.75 inches on manual transmission models. Compared to the thick, rigid drive shafts of traditional American sedans, the rope drive looked more like a metal cable than a power transmission component. Pontiac didn't do this for novelty. The curved shaft allowed torsional shocks from the engine, especially the violently vibrating Trophy 4, to be absorbed and damped. It also allowed the shaft to spin at very high speeds without dangerous resonance. The result was smoother power delivery to the rear-mounted transmission, while also allowing the floor to sit much lower thanks to the absence of a large central tunnel. One especially odd trait of the rope drive was this. It always spun whenever the engine was running, whether the car was moving or standing still. This produced a faint, distinctive humming sound that echoed up from beneath the floor, a sound many longtime Tempest owners still remember as an unmistakable mechanical memory. At the rear, Pontiac continued to defy convention with an independent swing axle suspension. In theory, swing axles had been heavily criticized for oversteer, most notoriously on the Corvair. But in the Tempest, the front-mounted engine changed everything. With weight no longer concentrated at the rear, the suspension proved far more stable and predictable. The Tempest wasn't a sports car, but it lacked the treacherous temperament that plagued the Corvair in hard cornering. The pinnacle of difference came with the automatic transmission known as Tempest Torque. Instead of a fully integrated automatic like the Hydromatic, Pontiac used a hybrid solution, a 10-inch torque converter, air-cooled, mounted externally at the rear of the car. From there, power was fed directly into the differential. This layout reduced weight minimized drivetrain losses, and according to Pontiac's own figures, improved fuel economy by about one mile per gallon at a steady 55 miles per hour, a significant gain in the early 1960s. The trade-off, however, was complexity and an unusual driving feel that left many local mechanics unsure of where to begin when it came time for repairs. Looking back at the Pontiac Tempest, it's difficult to place it neatly into any historical category. It wasn't a purely economy car. It wasn't a muscle car, nor was it a pop culture icon. The Tempest existed as a bold mechanical experiment, taken straight from the design studio to the showroom, without the safety net of compromise. In just three short years, Pontiac tested a series of ideas that still give engineers pause today. A half V8 engine to reduce costs, a curved torsion bar drive shaft, a rear mounted transmission to optimize weight distribution, and a flat floor that delivered exceptional interior space. These were not marketing tricks. They were genuine engineering decisions, complete with real risks and real consequences and it was precisely those risks that sealed the Tempest's fate. The system was so unconventional that mechanics struggled to work on it. The Trophy 4 engine vibrated and demanded careful maintenance. Production costs were never as low as hoped. As the American market began craving the power, sound, and simplicity of traditional V8s, the Tempest fell out of step. By 1964, Pontiac abandoned this philosophy entirely. The Tempest and Le Mans returned to the familiar A-body layout. Front-mounted V8, rear transmission, a safer, more marketable path. 
From that very foundation, the GTO was born, ushering in the legendary muscle car era. The experiment ended. The market won. But that doesn't make the Tempest a meaningless failure. On the contrary, it stands as proof of a time when American engineers were willing to break every rule, to ask, what if, before thinking about profit. Today, when modern supercars talk about transaxles, weight distribution, or vibration-optimized drivetrains somewhere in the background, the echo of the Tempest still remains. So, what do you think? Was cutting a V8 engine in half to power a family car an act of genius or an expensive mistake? If you'd like me to continue analyzing other crazy drivetrain systems in Detroit history, leave your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next strange and fascinating mechanical stories. See you next time.